What are the initial steps that academics should take when evaluating their current assessment design? Well, there are three principles behind designing good assessments. And the first one is to really think about what's the purpose of this? Why am I doing it? Why am I doing this type of assessment? Why am I doing it now? And then secondly, thinking about what is it that you're doing? So I'm doing this assessment at this point, but what am I trying to find out at this point? How is that going to help me? How is that going to help the learner? And then the final step in those three principles is about what is it that we've learned from doing this? Does it do what we want it to do? Now, those things sound like quite simple steps, <laughs> but quite often it, we get stuck in a rut. We decide, oh, I'll change a bit, or it seems like a big effort to change something, when in fact, actually, it's really, really important to reflect on what we're doing. And the reason for this is because whilst our content might not change dramatically within a curriculum, it's about the students, actually. It's about the learners. They're the variable that changes the most. And we should be considering every year as educators, who are this cohort? What's happening here? How are they interacting with the content of the teaching sessions at this point? And then what does that look like in terms of the assessment at the end? How are they going to interact? How are they going to show me what they know? So my attitude is always taking this as a very positive model. I want students to show me what they can do. I'm less interested at the, at the start in what they can't do. Obviously, I can help them overcome those things, but I'm always looking for what can they do? What are they interacting with? And taking the final step in your process of looking at what you have, essentially, mm. what, what is it that people should be looking for there? Because they may have lots of data and lots of information, but not necessarily know how to analyse it. Well, I think that's another really important point here is if you don't know how to analyse the data that you're collecting, the question you need to ask yourself is why are you collecting that data? I always say this to my students in assessment and I've said this to other staff members and teachers and other people that I've worked with. Only collect the data that you need to collect. None of us as educational researchers should ever be collecting data that we're not going to use. So. If you're collecting things and then thinking, I don't need that, then you shouldn't be collecting it. So you need to really think about what do I need to help me and what do I need to help the students too? And anything else beyond that is unnecessary. Are there any common indicators across most forms of assessment that would be useful to collect as a starting point, perhaps, if you're not sure about what you're collecting? I think really it's it's fundamental. So particularly, for example, in higher education, when you're teaching people a basic introductory course to whatever subject it is, you want your students to show you that they understand key concepts, that they can explain a theory, that they can also start to develop things like critical analysis, thinking, moving beyond description. So you would have those kind of things built into your criteria for assessment, or you should build those into your criteria for assessment. And then you can refine the levels of those criteria from basic understanding up to very, you know, highly eloquent understanding and argumentation, you know, as you structure a new curriculum or a new piece of assessment. How can academics design their assessments so that they're less susceptible to third parties or maybe even artificial intelligence answering the questions rather than the students? Well, I think one thing that we are beginning to learn, particularly in higher education, is that just repeating essay questions is no longer a good option. It becomes quite tempting to share answers um, around, etc. It's actually thinking about the structure as well of the writing. So thinking, how could I structure an assessment in a way that means it has to be created by that individual? I, you give students enough scope to choose a topic, perhaps, that they're focusing on, but then you also create a slightly different structure for um, the assessment itself. So you might create a, a different way of reporting it. You might ask a student to say, for example, create a portfolio of short pieces of evidence. You might ask them to create a poster. 
you might ask them to create. I mean, we, we give our students thing, options to uh, record podcasts, to make short films, to write policy style reports. It's all of these things. It's thinking in different ways about how you can approach the task that they need to do. And also what this brings with it as well is it brings some more authenticity to it because they're doing tasks that they would actually probably more likely do when they go into the workplace as opposed to sitting in an exam hall and writing an essay for two hours. Creating a report and putting it together over several months is a very, very different activity. And I think those are the sorts of ways that we can actually try and mitigate against any kind of problems of, of people sourcing information from elsewhere. How do educators ensure that continuous assessment doesn't become over-assessment? That's a very tricky question and a very tricky challenge, I think, for all educators. I think it's about being creative in how you do this and also sometimes being willing to perhaps take a few risks as an educator too. Um, we are quite risk averse in education and I think there's, you know, there's lots of good reasons for that because of how teachers and lecturers, etc., are held accountable for their roles and what they're doing. But it doesn't mean you can't try and take some risks and I think one of the really important things in terms of something like continuous assessment is making sure that you involve the student in it so that they don't feel like they're having stuff done to them continuously. And this is a narrative of the last sort of three decades in assessment research is that assessment's always been something that we do to students and the argument now is that it's better to do it with them. And that continuous cycle can include them a lot. It can include them reflecting on themselves. It can include them working with one another, peer assessing. It can include them assessing the teacher, assessing what they're learning, etc. And I think it's a case of the more that you involve the student in that process and the more that the teacher also can relinquish some of their, um, their own kind of power in that process, the less it becomes a, a lots of onerous tasks. It becomes a part of what we do in teaching and learning. It's a part of the pedagogy. It's not this other thing we've got to add on all the time. Though there's no absolute answer or ratio, how would an educator go about deciding whether they had the right blend of formative and summative assessments on their module or programme? That really depends what your subject is. There is no absolute formula for that. There will be certain topics and subjects that will need just a whole bunch of tests, and that's the best thing to do. There will be others that need very little of that kind of assessment, but might need more longitudinal kinds of assessment that finally perhaps result in a grade, but up until then are using a lot of formative tools in order to actually build and you know, construct the learning as you go. And I think um, it's quite, whilst it's tempting to want to say, yeah, this is a really good formula, I would never prescribe one, because I think you really have to do it case by case. One of the biggest problems we face in England, and I think we face it globally, to be honest, is people suggesting that there's one best way to do this. And the one, one big secret that I can let you all into in assessment is that there is no perfect assessment. It doesn't exist. It will never exist. <laughs> and the primary reason for that is because human beings are involved in it at some point along the way. And we all are riddled with error and inconsistency. So we do our best. Indeed. You mentioned then that some subjects may need lots of formative, some are just best assessed by lots of summative exams at the end. Mm. What are the sort of factors that people might look to to say, well, where do I fall on this scale or how do I best assess where I am if there's no magic number, which we've agreed that there mm. isn't? I think the other really important factor in this is not only subject, but it's also about are you looking for particular performance for a particular profession? So, for example, I always use the example when I'm teaching my students. I know, for example, that airline pilots do regular testing. They are tested um, consistently on the use of instrumentation. They're tested on um, their response skills and everything else. You want to know when you get in an aeroplane that that pilot taking you up there, that she's been acing her tests constantly. <laughs> That's what I want. Same with a surgeon who's yeah. about to cut me open. You know, 
So that, that kind of assessment, that's the one. They're very extreme examples, but they're good examples because those are the, the ones where we need to know there's a baseline here that's, that's critical. You know, it's life or death. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we need to know that people are passing them accurately and we need to know that the test is reliable and we need to know that they're doing what, they, what they're supposed to be doing so we can trust in that. But I think with other assessments then, you have got a border measure and this is where it starts to get difficult for everybody, for all of us, because we have to just trust in the systems that we have at the moment. And there are limits to, um, you know, the, the absolute reliability of many test results and many test outcomes. But again, as I said, they're only as good as they can be.